Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a great DockerCon. Uh, my name's Eric. I'm here to talk to you about getting legacy apps into Kubernetes securely and quickly using Docker Desktop. I'm Eric Smalling. I am a senior developer advocate at Sneak. We are a developer-focused container security and application security uh, company. We power Docker Scan, if you use that tool, as well as the uh, vulnerability scanning behind Docker Hub. I have a developer background, so I've using, been using Docker since 0.7, back before we had Kubernetes or any kind of orchestrator or even Compose. So uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to uh, teach you some stuff here. And if not anything, uh, if you have any questions, visit me in the virtual booth afterwards. I'll be hanging out. Uh, but the agenda, I have very little time and a lot to talk about. So we're going to have a very, very tiny Kubernetes crash course. If you are brand new to Kubernetes, um, you are not going to learn Kubernetes from my talk, but hopefully I'll give you enough to allow you to follow along and some resources uh, you know, to further your education and learn how to uh, get your jump started. Um, then we're going to take a legacy app uh, that we have. We already have containerized it. We've ar we already have like a compose file, but now we need to get it into Kubernetes. And in order to do that, we're going to use uh, the Kubernetes on your desktop that you have with Docker Desktop. Then we'll talk about a few of the security things that I will have to skip because I have so little time, but we'll, we'll touch on them, show you some of the risks and some of the defenses you can put up uh, using Kubernetes and Docker. And then of course, uh, because we're on Docker desktop, there's a couple of efficiency tricks I can show you that uh, I think you might find useful. So Kubernetes in 10 minutes. Well, I don't have 10 minutes. Let's try it in five. Let's see if I can get you enough info um, so what is Kubernetes? It's an orchestrator, just like Swarm, Mesos, um, uh, Nomad. Uh, it, it, I like how the, the guys that wrote Production Kubernetes, uh, which is the book that you see down there in the corner, uh, that QR code will get you a free copy if you want a PDF copy of it. Uh, it's a big book, but it's a great reference. But in chapter one, they boil down what is really an orchestrator, but what is Kubernetes? It, it's a way to provide, um, it's a provide a way for us to run and schedule containerized workloads on multiple hosts. The main concepts we're going to hit on today are the pod. So the pod in Kubernetes is the smallest deployable computing unit um, that you can create and manage. Uh, it wraps a container. In fact, you can have more than one container, one or more. If you're used to deploying containers and controlling them, you got to think abstractly. Now you got to think that the pod kind of wraps around it. And one of the things that you get when you deploy a pod is a guarantee that if you have multiple containers, all the containers in that pod will run on the same physical host. So whatever node or host or machine, whatever you want to call it, that it gets deployed to, it will always deploy all those containers to the same host. And it'll actually put them in the same network namespace. So if you're familiar with containers, you know that we have namespaces and C groups and whatnot. Um, the network namespace, normally a container, if you just do Docker run, is going to get its own network namespace, its own IP address, its own IP stack, really. Well, in Kubernetes, the pod gets that network namespace. So in this example, you've got 10.91.100. Uh, well, all the containers that start up are, are attached to that same network namespace. So in this example, the e-commerce app container and the log watcher app could actually talk to each other on localhost. They would see each other on, on localhost. Each pod in Kubernetes is guaranteed to get a unique IP address. So you could, so let's say we had two replicas of the same pod you stand up. This one has 10.9.100. Let's say another one starts up on some other host and it gets 10.9.2.83. I, I don't know, what, whatever it's going to get in the range, uh, it, it'll get those. Now, uh, by default, every pod is guaranteed in Kubernetes uh, networking to be able to talk to each other without any kind of NAT or anything on your part that you have to do. Now, you can restrict that. Um, afterwards, but the default is they can talk to each other. They don't need any special networking capabilities to be able to do that. Now, the next thing to talk about is the deployment. Deployment is a higher level abstraction above the pod. It manages the life cycle of the pods um, of, of a given set of uh, a given pod. So every de deployment has a one to one mapping with a pod specification and can run zero to n number of that of replicas of that pod. So in this case, we have two pods. We've named them pod web app, and, and uh, we, we have, uh, as you can see in the YAML, replicas two, and it's running uh, some kind of image called ecom at version 1.0. That's why I put the 1.0 in the diagram, right? Uh, one of the first things that uh, you might use the deployment for is uh, to scale. So we're at replicas two. What if we change that to replicas three? Well, the cluster will see that when we apply that uh, deployment, and it will say, oh, okay, make sure there's three running now. 
Another thing that's common is, let's say I need to upgrade the image to 1.1. Uh, by uh, the deployment uh, abstraction artifact object has the concept of an implementation of a rollout and a rollback functionality for doing such things. So if I changed it to 1.1, it would, by default, destroy each of the pods and, and stand up one that had the new version, and then in succession go through all the replicas and do that one at a time. Again, there are other strategies you can, you can use. That's the default one, um, and it will roll through them and make sure that you still have three, as you've declared, now at 1.1. I can also issue a rollback, which will go back to a prior version. So if I rolled back one, it would go back to the 1.0 version. More likely, you're probably just going to issue a new deployment that has a new version in your tag if you're rolling forward, as we all like to do. The third object type I'm going to talk about is service. Now, a service does a few things. It provides a logical grouping of pods, and it does this by, by uh, so what we call selectors. Pods have labels that you can apply, and in this case, I've graphically shown these as this web app pod, web app pod has a couple labels. One is app, and the value is web app and the other is tier, and the value is front end. The service is selecting those by, by criteria, as you see in the YAML down in the selector section, that says, look for app, web app, tier, front end. By definition, those three in this diagram would qualify and become part behind this service. The service exposes these pods behind a single IP address and a DNS name. So if we declare as the YAML shows, a service called Ecom with that selector, and we say, hey, listen for traffic coming into the service on port 80, and send that traffic to the pods at 8080. It will do that. So it will register a service named Ecom with the DNS server inside of Kubernetes, and any other pod, any other process running in the, in the, in the, um, uh, uh, the cluster that wants to talk to my web app pods can just refer to the service. They don't need to know the pod IP addresses. They don't need to know what hosts they're running on. They don't need to know when they move uh, because they can move. If uh, I were to rescale or upgrade or a node goes down, the schedulers are going to move these pods around. They're ephemeral so they can be anywhere in the cluster. And my customers of these these web services or whatever they are don't need to know that. They just need to know there's a service declared named Ecom. I am going to send traffic to the host name Ecom. And the service will keep track of all of that and make sure that traffic is going to the right IPs and the DNS resolutions will work. And all that is just magic behind the scenes and you don't need to worry about. Um, it does provide a kind of load balancing across the pods, although I wouldn't call this implementation load balancing because as you'll see, there is another load balancing term we'll get to. So let's enough of this slide stuff. Let's get into the demonstration. Um, again, I have a, a Java. It's a to-do list. Um, if you've seen any of my sneak demos before, you probably have seen this app. Um, it's a Tomcat J2EE application that is already containerized. Um, uh, like I said, I have a compose file, but I, now I want to move it into Kubernetes. Um, it, uh, and I want to do, do that in a way that I don't want to have to provision a cloud uh, cluster or and pay for it. Uh, I don't want to have to deal with my company provisioning one or provisioning a namespace or do, doing anything for me. I just want to run this locally so that I can just iteratively work and have be isolated. Maybe I'm going to be on a plane. I, I don't know. Um, but this is where Docker Desktop's Kubernetes uh, becomes very nice. Now, if you've not seen Docker Desktop Kubernetes, if you've not uh, activated it, the way you do that, in fact, I'll just do it right here. If you go to your, if you have Docker already running, Docker Desktop it is. Go to the dashboard and go to the gear settings icon and choose Kubernetes. I already have it running. If I didn't, this would be unchecked. Click it, say apply. The first time you do this, you need to have an internet connection because it's going to go down and download, go out to the internet and download a bunch of uh, Kubernetes bits. Let's take a look at our app. So we have two services. We have a database and at the top we have the app. We service Java goof. Uh, build, you know, with Compose, you can build it, so we do. Uh, we call the image Java goof, we set the environment. Um, you're going to see passwords and crap in here. Don't worry about that. Uh, there, this is not the way you would normally do this. This is a demo. Um, I don't have time in this short amount of time to get into the proper way to do credentials and secrets. We'll touch on it, but I, don't worry about it. Don't get hung up on it. Um, we're going to expose port 8080, which is what our app li listens on. And then in the second service named Java goof DB, we base that on MySQL server. 
and we um, have the port for it and some environment variables for it. So let's take a look, look at what the Kubernetes manifests would be, the, the, the object definitions would be to do the same thing in Kubernetes. I'm going to start from the database side and we're going to go to the bottom of this file. I've got two objects. I've got a deployment and a service. And I'm going to do, talk about the service first. The service is declared, it's given a name. This is the host name that will be assigned to it. The DNS resolution will be javagoof-db, just like we had in the compose file. The specification for the service is saying, listen on port 3306, TCP protocol. Any traffic coming into that, send it to the pods that this service is going to be wrapped around. What pods? Well, there's the selector I talked about. The selector, javagoof and db for the app and the tier. If we come back up to the deployment, remember I told you deployment wraps the pod. There's a lot of boilerplate in here I'm going to skip past because it's not worth talking about at the moment. But know that this deployment, it's going to say replicas one. I only want one of these. This is not a clustered database. I just want one copy. Here's the template. This is the template for the pod that it will provision. That template is saying uh, set the pods labels up to be Java goof DB, which is what we saw down here. So any pod that this starts, will met, this selector will see it and it will add it to the list of pods, or the only pod in this case, that traffic should go to. And then we have similar stuff to what we saw in the, in the compose file. So we've got an image, um, don't worry about the other boilerplate in here. Um, and, and again, this is not how you do this. Don't, don't use environment variables with hard-coded passwords, not telling you to do that. That's the database. If we look at the application, very similar. Uh, here we have, the, I'm going to look at the service again first. Uh, we have Java Goof is the name, so anything else in the cluster that wants to hit it will be able, could do so at the Java Goof host name. We have a type of load balancer. Put a pin in that, come back to that in a second. Uh, and the session affinity we'll talk about in a second. This is listening on port 80, so traffic coming into this service on port 80, TCP, will be sent to whatever pod it goes to on target port 8080. So here's one where we're doing a translation. So we're kind of you know, 80, hand it off to and send it to the pod uh, at 8080 and use the selector Java Goof web app, which is different than the DB tier. Uh, we'll look at the deployment in a second. Now this type, load balancer, when you deploy a service into a cluster, generally that cluster is going to, if it's a cloud cluster, it will have a cloud controller that will watch for services of load balancer type. Uh, by default, the type is something called cluster IP, which is an internal only facing IP address. You can't hit it from outside. Load balancer type uh, is a cluster IP. It will get one. So you could have an IP address inside the cluster that you could hit it at. But also the cloud controller will see this and it will create a load balancer. So let's say we're in EKS. It will it'll create, I think it creates an ALB and it will configure it to attached to this service and the pods behind it. Um, it'll do all that wiring up for you. And uh, when you pull the information on that service, you will see whatever publicly facing uh, host name that that uh, ALB has, it'll be it'll show it to you and you could actually hit it from ex you know from outside with that. Session affinity, this application uh, is uh, sticky. It, it, it uses in memory um, states and so it needs sticky sessions. Now the pod for the app, uh, again, a lot of boilerplate at the top, but the important things to re recognize here, we have three replicas. So we're gonna start three copies of the pod. Then we have these, uh, the template for the, the pod and we declare the label, Java Goof app, but web app tier, as opposed to the DB tier that the database was on. And that matches the selector here. So this service will see all three of those replicas and it will send traffic to one of those three pods when it gets traffic. To, to pass through. And then the container spec is similar. It just has an image um, and a name and, and whatnot, boilerplate. So let's deploy this. And I'm going to deploy all of it at once. So I'm just going to say everything in this directory. I'm going to get an error because there's a non Kubernetes file in there. Don't worry about that. So you can see it created the deployment and service for Java Goof and for the DB. And if I do a get all, I can see I have three Java Goof named pods that have a unique ID at the end and one Java Goof DB named pod that has its own unique ID. Then I have two services besides the Kubernetes service, which is just the Kubernetes control plane. Um, this is Java Goof, which is of type load balancer. And this is Java Goof DB of type cluster IP. 
both of them have a cluster IP. And if I was inside a process or inside a container in the cluster, I could hit that IP and it would be hitting the service. However, this one, the Java Goof one, also has that local host uh, external IP. Now this is a Docker desktop cool feature. So if I'm in a cloud cluster, I'm gonna have an ALB here. If I'm in a on-prem cluster, I might have an F5 IP if it's been configured up, or I might have metal LB might be installed. And do the cluster operators have to set that up and make sure that that is in place. Running in your local, you don't want to have to deal with metal LB. Not that you know, no shade to metal LB; it's a great product. Or or CubeVip to my buddy Dan out there, you know, great products. But I don't have to do anything. Docker Desktop sees that this is a load balancer type service, and it's just going to go ahead and set up a proxy-ish kind of a thing on localhost. So my localhost port 80 should be listening. Let's let's go to a browser and check it out. Localhost on port 80 and my context is to-do list. There's my app. So let's sign into it. Drag this over here. So we pre-populate the database with a bunch of stuff and here, here we go. Great, so uh, let's pause here for a second and talk about some of the security things that I was uh, mentioning. This app is great, uh, but any app can have uh, vulnerabilities. This one actually does. I'm not going to be demonstrating vulnerabilities in this talk, but uh, know that there's a couple of remote code execution vulnerabilities in this app. That means I could get in and run arbitrary code that I want to, even though I'm just coming in from the outside. That's really bad. Now, in a container, getting a, getting a shell, basically, in a container and running anything I want, um, uh, what well, that's bad, it's, it's worse if you're running things as, say, root. So the default user in most op uh, official images is root, although there are other users you could use instead. You should. You should not run as root unless you absolutely need to, and you probably don't, especially if you're running business apps. Um, there is a concept in Kubernetes in the pod and container specifications called security context. And there are a bunch of things you can set up with in there. And one of them is run as non-root and you can set it to true. It defaults to false because they don't want to block out everything you got. But um, if you set that to true, when, when Kubernetes, the kubelet, goes to start up a pod, the container in the pod, I should say, it looks at it and says, is that going to start as root? Is it going to be UID zero? And if it is, it won't start it, and it will not. It, your pod will not construct. Okay, the container will stop with a fail state. Um, there are a couple ways to get around, you know, to 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 solve this. One is to in your image that you're building, set a default user with the user line, and um, then the default won't be root. Uh, if you do that, you need to use the UID, not just the, the name. Don't just use nobody or Eric or whatever because the kubelet won't know before the container's running if that's UID 0 or not. So you need to use user 1001 or whatever it would be so that the kubelet can see that and say, oh, that's not 0, I can start. The other way to do it is in the security context, you can say run as user and run as group and feed the UID GID in right in your, uh, your, pod, your pod YAML. Then if I do exploit and I get in, I, I reduce that blast radius of what I can do because now I'm not root in the container. That means I, I can't install software with the package manager probably. I can't, if, if there happens to be a bind mount to the host, a host vol volume mounted in, which you shouldn't be doing, but if you did, if I'm root, I'm UID zero on the host volume because it's mounted in and I'm UID zero and yay. If you're not, then I, I'll have limited access to it. Again, this isn't, the silver bullet, but it reduces that blast radius of what I can do. Another common one that people don't do that you sh should is uh, run a read-only root file system. So in Docker, if you do Docker run and you say dash dash read-only, the container engine will not start, um, it will not place the read-write layer above the image, the read-only image layers. And when the process starts, it gets a read-only file system effectively. Um, immutable containers are great because they're easy to move around for one thing, but if an attacker gets in with a similar kind of an exploit and they can't modify the file system, it makes it really hard for them to expand that exploit. They're not going to be easily able to pull files down from their S3 bucket using curl or something that you might have left in your image. They're not going to be able to um, easily modify your application or your data files, or 
clean up after themselves by, by deleting logs or, or scrubbing logs. So making it read only, making it not be root, these are two easy ones you can set up that will make life harder for, for a hacker. There are a lot of other things. So the security context has a bunch of stuff. We have a, a cheat sheet that my, my colleague Matt and I wrote a while ago that goes over the top 10 and we'll talk about good settings for these things um, and why that the, the, you should set them that way. There's a lot of other things you can do. Uh, I can't, I just don't have time to get into too much more. Come see me at the virtual booth if you want to talk more about it and some other uh, aspects. So one more thing I wanted to discuss is some of the, one of the things that you want to do, let's say, let's say you're looking at this and say, you know what, that, that L, it's supposed to have been capitalized. So um, let's come over here into my code. Now, if I just make this capital, now, if you're a you know a, a Java developer, you know, okay, well, I'm going to come here. I'm going to rebuild. And, um, oh, I'm in a Docker container. I got to build my container now, my image. And then I got to bounce the pod so that it pulls the new image in, which is not horrendous, but it's just a hurdle that if you're trying to do iterative development, it's kind of annoying. And if you're in a language like Node.js, JavaScript, or or if you're Python or something, where you're in, you're used to being able to just edit Refresh, edit, refresh. That's really annoying to have to create a new image, redeploy it to Kubernetes. Now in Docker only, outside of Kubernetes, a lot of folks will do a Docker run and they'll do a bind mount. The only time I, I approve a bind mount <laughs> is if you're doing it on your local desktop for that purpose, for iterative, quick development. So you're changing the contents and the mounted folder is in the container where normally the, the image would have had the, the contents. Now it's got your live contents. And you can see those changes right in your container without having to bounce it. You can do this on Docker Desktop Kubernetes. Uh, so the way you do that is through a, what we call a volume, a, a host path volume. This is a bind mount in Kubernetes ease. Um, what you're looking at is a snippet of a pod spec. If this isn't a full pod spec. We'll talk about why in a second. But in a given pod, if you have at, if you add a volume mount, and I'm putting the mount path for my image at the same place that the image has the uh, web app content, right? This will mount this volume called to-do list SRC over what's in the image so that it will eclipse it. And I'll see what's coming in through this bind mount, this host path. Now the path is a variable at this point. I could make these changes to my app.yaml. I could just slap that stuff in here, do my work, and then remove it again when I'm ready to do that. That's not really clean, and I might accidentally check that in. That's not the best way to do this. So there's another tool that I'm a fan of called Customize. And I don't, again, I don't have time to go into everything Customize does, but the gist of it is Customize allows you to set up uh, commonly use it for environments, development, staging, test, and you can overlay replacements for things or augment your Kubernetes YAML with things like this. This is what we call a patch. So customize, again, I can't go into all of it, is set up to say, hey, when somebody does a, de a development, a run of the customized builder, go into the, the apps YAML, then all the ML. Look for a deployment named Java Goof. Set its replicas to one because I, as on my own desktop, I don't need three. Um, set the the container spec to change the image pull policy to never because I really don't want it going out and pulling down an image from uh, somewhere else. Set up this volume and volume mount, and only do that ephemerally for this where I'm running it. Don't ch I'm not physically changing, physically changing the, the app.yaml so that I will accidentally check that in and screw it up in the CI server. This is just what I'm going to use locally. Now, how does this work? Let's let's go ahead and clear out what I have running. The syntax is kind of long, so I've made a shell script to do this. I'm going to run it and then let it get this thing going, and then I'll show you how it works. So we'll do dev run sh, and I'll just show you dev run. So this shell script, what it's doing. First, it's setting it that, remember that, I'll show you that variable SRC. I'm setting that. I'm saying, hey, grab the current working directory from the PWD environment and then tag on this path, which goes to my Maven module target to-do list where the web app is gets built. And then, done. Now, the customized tool gets called and says, hey, 
build what you the patches you find in development. So it's a directory under KAS overlays development. I've got that. That's where that patch is and a small configuration file to tell customize, you know, my environment. If I ran that all by itself, it would spit out all of the all of the YAML to start my application up with those patches applied to it. Now, it doesn't deal with environmental variables, so I'm actually using another Linux tool called ENV Subst. That will overlay that curly brace surrounded SRC variable with the environmental variable SRC, which I've de declared here. So we get our updated YAML, we substitute in the variable name, and then we just pipe that into kubectl apply. Now, when I did that, it started everything up. And just to prove that this works, since I made the change over there in the file here, and I'm going to need to refresh because I killed that app and started a new copy. So I'm going to come back in here and sign back in to get a new session. And there it is in capital. And let's say, oh, well, that's not quite right. Uh, I don't want it to say my. That sounds funny. Let's save that. And now this is Java, so I am going to have to do a Maven package to bring that into the target directory. Um, I could get more fancy and try to make it so they don't have to do that, but you know, this is just a demo. And I'm going to refresh the page, and now the my is gone. So now I have my iterative fast deployment loop that I, or development loop that I, I want. So here's the example. You know, here's what we had. Our diagram. Uh, browser talks to a load balancer, which uh, on the service, which picks a pod, which then talks to the DB service, which talks to the pod. And then when we added the uh, the uh, the host path. We're, we're basically mounting on top of this this container the uh, the volume from my workstation and uh, making it so we can iteratively work. Here's those links I was talking about. Uh, uh, documents for Docker desktop Kubernetes. The Kubernetes homepage where all their documents are. This is your best friend. Uh, the customized tool I was showing you, that's where you can go to learn about it. Uh, that's that cheat sheet. Here's the URL for that. Um, go take a look at that. Um, and finally, if you're learning Kubernetes, if you're wanting to really know Kubernetes as a developer, the CKAD, Certified Kubernetes Application Developer Certification from the Linux Foundation, from the CNCF, um, is wonderful. It is hard, <laughs> but it, what, if you can get that cert, you can be pretty well assured you know how to do this. Um, and uh, it, it will take you a while, probably, to earn that cert if you've not done Kubernetes before. But it, it is a worthwhile endeavor, and I can't recommend it uh, more highly. Um, and uh, if you get that, go get your CKS, get your security cert. Uh, that probably is the hardest of them. Um, so anyway, thanks again. Come see me in the virtual booth. Um, if I can do demos in there, I will. Uh, otherwise, uh, I can point you to, to other resources. Have a great day.